upset if we just came and sang and I didn't even get up and preach. But before you get too excited about that, I am going to speak. Uh, but I was thinking about the words of the songs and realizing, you know, they are a message in themselves. They're a challenge. They're an exhortation in themselves. And I hope that uh, that is the effect that it has on your heart when we're together and we, we worship together in that way. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this little phenomenon. I'm sure that it's uh, prevalent in other parts of the country too, but I know that it definitely is here. Over the last few weeks, if you've come outside in the morning to get into your car and seen a faint yellow haze all over your car, has anybody else noticed that in the last couple of three weeks? Maybe not so much the last week or so, but I know I have. Or maybe your eyes are burning every time you open the windows in your house or you go outside or you go for a walk or something like that. Um, that's pollen, in case you didn't know what that is. And because I'm very strange and because I have a trivial mind, which I've shared with you before, I like random facts and I like to know things about stuff that nobody else cares about. And so you guessed it, I googled pollination. I know that pollen is very important. I didn't know all of the details and so I decided I wanted to find out a little bit about it and why God would allow us to have all this yellow stuff all over our vehicles and our eyes be burning all the time. And I quickly got distracted from just straight pollination. I can, you're riveted, and this is awesome. I'm glad you're so interested, as interested as I am. I quickly went from pollination to bee pollination. That's a lot more interesting, right? <laughs> Bee pollination. Folks, now, this is where it's at. You've got to go home and Google bee pollination, okay? I didn't realize, because I'm not really into bees, I guess, or pollination, that bee pollination was such a huge deal. But there have been multiple studies done that say, that all come to the same conclusion, that over the last several years, that bee pollination has resulted in a benefit to the U.S. economy to the tune of $14.6 billion a year in extra crops and fruit and so on that are growing in our country just because of bee pollination. Now, come on, you got to admit, that's pretty amazing, right? $14.6 billion increase in food production in our country that's directly related to bee pollination. There are millions of, uh, I guess you call them colonies, bee colonies, and they get trucked all over the country and put in certain places so that the bees can pollinate plants and fruit, tree, fruit trees and vegetables and all of those kinds of things. I did not realize this. Just one more bee pollination fact, okay? <laughs> I didn't realize this, but I am told that without bee pollination, listen to this, we would have no apples, no almonds, no blueberries, no cherries, no avocados, no cucumbers, no onions, no grapefruit, no oranges, and no pumpkins if we had no bee pollination. And there's probably more that I don't know about. But those are the top 10 crops in the United States that would not exist if it were not for bee pollination. Now, listen to this. Scientists have studied how this happens, how they do it, and they cannot develop, they have tried, they cannot develop a process scientifically to do what bees do naturally every day. They can't do it. They have tried. And it is not possible. We need bees to do this. They, you can't teach them how to do this. Bees are born to do this. You know, if you ever saw a bee truck or a bee Harley on the back, it would have a bumper sticker, born to pollinate. Because that's what they do. Come on, that was a good one. Jeez. This is, a, I, this is a tough crowd. I'm, I'm struggling here, struggling to kind of get rolling now. You've got to help me out a little bit. Bees are, born, <laughs> bees are born to do this. They are born to pollinate. 
there, that it just comes naturally to them, and there's nothing else that we can do with all of our technology to accomplish what they do naturally. Now, if you've been here very much over the last few months, you know that we have been talking a lot about our mission as Christ followers. And Tim referred to it earlier when he was talking about what God has called us to do as a church. He has called us to reproduce. We've been talking about what the Holy Spirit that God has given to us and His purpose and our purpose is to point people to Christ. Christ followers are born to reproduce. That's our purpose on this earth is to reproduce ourselves. I want you to know this. There is no other way to generate Christ followers in this world except for the Christ followers that we have reproducing. There's no other way to generate Christ followers in this world than for the Christ followers that we have to reproduce. We cannot wave a magic wand and make more Christ followers. We cannot create a program that will develop more Christ followers. I cannot, Tim cannot, Tom cannot, nor can anyone in this world preach a message that will create more Christ followers. The only way is for the ones that we have to reproduce. And the Apostle Paul knew this, and he talks about it in 2 Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, you can join me in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And yes, Tim, that is one of the two verses I'm using. And you did say some of the things I want to say. We'll talk about that afterwards. But that's all right, because I have all kinds of things that I can say, so I won't come up short. But Paul was talking about this in 2 Timothy, and just to set the scene a little bit, Paul is nearing the end of his life. He knows that his life is almost over. He's in prison. He's on trial. And he did indeed lose his life shortly after writing this book of 2 Timothy. But he wants to just pass on a little bit more of what he knows and what God has taught him to Timothy, who was a young pastor at the time, just to give him a little bit more of that wisdom that he has gained through his experience. And I want to just read that first verse for you and note a couple of things in it. It says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice this. I don't know how much you pay attention. If, if you are a person who reads your Bible regularly, and I hope if you're a Christ follower that you are, if you read your Bible regularly, I don't know how much you pay attention to the greetings at the beginnings of books particularly in the New Testament, these letters are like this in the beginning of the chapter. But I want you to notice this. He says, Timothy, my dear son. This is not a casual greeting here. Paul is addressing Timothy, and the way he does implies that there was a strong relationship between the two of them. There was a deep connection between Paul and Timothy. Paul loved Timothy he cared for him like he was his own son. They were very, very close. And I want you to understand that this relationship between them was a big part of the reason that Timothy was who he was at this point in his life. A big part of the reason that Timothy was walking with God and that God was using him to minister to this church was because of the relationship that he had with the Apostle Paul. Let me ask you this question. What is the greatest influence in your life? What is the thing that influences and impacts most what you think, what you do, how you spend your time, how you spend your money? I bet for most of us it comes down to our relationships. The people that we spend our time with, the people that we are connected to, the people that we talk with. That was true for Timothy, and that relationship was the Apostle Paul. Paul says, I want you to be strong, Timothy. What I'm going to tell you requires a lot of work. It's very difficult. 
I want you to know that Christ will supply what you need. And then he shares with him verse number two, which is the one that Tim read for us just a moment ago. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Because they had spent so much time together, Paul had taught Timothy a lot of things. And I think it's very interesting that he says, not only have you heard these things from me, and like Tim referred to a moment ago, these are, these are the truths of God's Word. That's what he was passing along to Timothy. But he not only taught them to him, but they were confirmed by lots of other people in Timothy's life. Okay, So that means that Timothy not only had this deep connection to the Apostle Paul, and well, that relationship was strong and vibrant, but he had a connection to a lot of other people as well. There were other people in Timothy's life who spoke into his life and said, Timothy, this stuff is real. This Christ life that we're talking about, this whole idea of living by faith, this whole concept of orienting your life to the truths of God's Word, this is real, this is true. The fact that through Christ, nothing is impossible, as we just sang. Timothy, I've seen that happen in my life. I've seen God do things that were physically impossible. That everyone around me said couldn't happen. I've seen it happen because God has the power to do it. They were confirmed in Timothy's life by many witnesses. As I thought about that verse this week, I realized, you know, that's really what we do here. In fact, that's why this matters. That's why it's important that we do this together. We teach the truths of God's Word, what it means to become like Christ, what it means to follow Him, and there is value to doing it together. Now, you don't have to come here too many weeks in a row before you hear one of us say, as a Christ follower, you need to be taking God's Word on your own at home, and you need to read it for yourself, and you need to learn from it, and you need to grow by it on your own time. And that is true. But there's value for us in doing it together, too, because when we come together and one of us stands here and we teach the truths of God's Word, all of us are witnesses that this is true. And we can confirm with each other that this is what God is saying to us. And this is what God is doing. How many times after you leave here, or maybe while you're still here, do you have a conversation with somebody about something that we talk about here on Sunday? Sometimes if you go home and flip on your computer, there's a conversation about it on Facebook. And somebody will make a comment about something that is said, and others will comment and back and forth and discuss it. And sometimes around the tables when we're drinking coffee and, and eating a bagel or something, we talk about it. And later in our groups, we talk about it. That's what Paul is talking about. It's confirmed among many witnesses. We're doing it together. And when we all hear the same things, we need to encourage each other to pursue them. But as we notice here reading this verse, there is a little bit more. Timothy, those things that you've heard and have been witnessed to by other people and understand and have confirmed them all, I want you to teach them to others. And this is sometimes where it breaks down. Because for a lot of us that are here in this room this morning, maybe not everyone, maybe you're just checking things out or you come once in a while to see what's going on or because you're having a rough week and you need some encouragement, and that's fine. But for most of us who are here right now, we know that we need this. We know we need to come together. We know we need to be taught. We know we need to be encouraged by other people. But how many of us go to the next step? Paul says you need to teach these things to others. Let me say this this morning. This is true of right now. 
This is true of what Tim talked about last week and the week before and what I talked about the couple weeks before that. And it's true for what I'm going to talk about next week and what will be taught beyond that. Here it is. Are you ready? You are being taught so that you will be able to teach. Okay? You are being taught so that you will be able to teach. There is no prize when you get to heaven for the accumulation of knowledge. You're not being taught so that you'll be smarter. You're not being taught so that you'll know more stuff about the Bible. You are being taught so that you will be able to teach other people. That is the reason why we are here. That is the, God's purpose for the church. I want you to understand that this it's about the propagation of the species, folks. It's about the propagation of the species. Christ followers were born to reproduce. If you are a Christ follower this morning, if you have trusted Jesus Christ with your heart, if you have given Him your life, the reason why you were born into God's family was to reproduce more Christ followers. That's why we're here. Just like without bee pollination, there'll be no apples and no cucumbers and no almonds and no blueberries. Without Christ followers reproducing, there will be no church. Now, ultimately, it is God's work to build His church, and He will do that. He is the one who changes hearts and lives. But He chooses, mystifyingly, to do it through us. Tim was talking about earlier, and as we will continue to t talk more about in the weeks to come, we have a responsibility here. We have a responsibility. 11, 12 years ago, when a couple of families sat in the living room and said, our burden, our passion is to see God start a church where we can invite our family and our friends who don't know God and not be concerned about what we look like or where we've been or what we've been involved in, but to come together and hear about the hope that only God can give. And ten years ago when Tim and Pam came, and nine years ago when Melody and I came, we all had one goal in mind, not just to see one church be established, but many churches to be established, all doing the same thing. We have a responsibility here of reproduction, of multiplication. Thirty-five or forty years ago, if you had a little home maintenance project that you had to do, you went down to the corner hardware store. Every town had one. Just a little place right on the street. There was probably no place to park, and that was a little irritating. And you went inside, you opened the heavy wooden door, and it probably had a little bell on the top. And you swung it open, and as soon as you walked in, the place was packed. It was downtown, so it was small, and the shelves were overflowing with stuff. And the first thing you thought of when you walked in that was, oh man, I am never going to be able to find anything in here. But it didn't matter because as soon as the little bell rung, George or Bill or Frank or whoever ran the store came out to greet you and said, what you guys doing today? And you said something like putting a new porch light up. So he said, no problem. And he walked right to where all the lights were and he rummaged around and pulled out the one you wanted and said, now... Your house is brick, isn't it? Because the town was small enough so he knew what your house looked like. 
well, if you're going to do that, then you're going to need one of these. And so we walked over to where the masonry drill bits were, and he got you a drill bit and said, and you're going to need a little piece of conduit. Here, let me draw you a little sketch of how this should look. And George drew it out and put all the things you needed on the counter, rang it up for you, and you went home and did it. Today, if you have a little home maintenance project, you go to Home Depot. There is all kinds of parking in the lot. And when you walk in, the ceiling is 35 feet high, and there are five acres of home maintenance supplies. When you find that electrical is in row 29, and you came in the door that's by row 2, you will see at the other end of the row a guy with an orange apron. And if you are fast enough to run to the end of the row and get to him, you will find that he's usually in the paint department, but somebody called in sick, so he's covering electrical. Which means that you're on your own. Do you know what's missing in those two pictures? George! George is missing. You know what's missing? The relationship. It's the relationship. And our churches can become like that. We're stepping into the 21st century. We get all kinds of gadgets, we get technology, we got programs. We got this, we got that. Do you know what's missing? The relationship. The George principle. The guy that knows you and cares about you and understands what you need and takes the pencil from behind his ear and sketches it out for you. That's what's missing. Folks, relationships are what matter. You don't have to come here to this church very long before you realize we don't really have much for programs. We have done that on purpose. We could run programs... I know Tim could. I know I can. We've done it. We're not doing it. Because we have intentionally encouraged you and allowed ourselves the freedom to build relationships with people. Because that is what matters. That is what results in the reproduction of the species. We've challenged you to start groups. We've challenged you to start LTGs. We've challenged you to connect with your neighbors. We've challenged you to spend time with your coworkers outside of work. Why? Because the relationship is what does it. Two questions and then we're done. Question number one. Which lost people in your life are you building a relationship with for the goal of sharing the gospel? The goal of sharing Christ. Who is it in your life who does not know God that you're building a relationship with? With the goal in mind, you're praying for them every day and you have a goal of sharing Christ with them one day. You're thinking, it's coming. One day, we're building this relationship and one day, Tim spent 10 years sitting in a stinky hockey locker room. If you've never been in a hockey locker room, it's really nothing to be uh, writing home about. Sitting in that locker room, beside Jeff, talking about the weather, talking about grilling steaks in the summer, talking about family, talking about work, and all the time. You know what Tim's doing? 
He's having the conversation, but you know what he's thinking? <laughs> it's coming, Jeff. It's coming. We're building this relationship, and one day, you don't even know it yet, but we're going to talk about God. And now Jeff is a part of the kingdom of God. He's a part of the family. So who is in your life that does not know God, that you are talking to, that you are relating to, with the purpose of sharing Christ? And here's the second question. Who is younger than you in the faith with whom you are sharing what you know? You say, well, I'm pretty young in the faith. What am I going to teach this somebody younger? I don't care how little you know. You know more than some people, and you should be sharing it. If you can honestly answer those two questions, now hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm not saying you're not a Christ follower. But hear what I'm saying. If you can't answer honestly those two questions, you are not yet who God made you to be. Did you hear that? If you cannot answer those two questions, you are not yet who God made you to be because a Christ follower was born to reproduce. We sang Build Your Kingdom a few minutes ago and I wrote down a couple of lines. They're my favorite two lines, but I figured I'd forget them, so I wrote them down to make sure I got them right. At one point, we say, we were made for so much more than this. You know what? You were made for more than getting up in the morning, going to work, earning a paycheck, and coming home and spending it. You were made for more than that, and so was I. And then do you know what the next line of that song is? It's a prayer to God. You know what it says? It says, awake the kingdom seed in us. There is a kingdom seed in you that God planted when he saved you. And he wants nothing more than to open that baby up and allow you to reproduce. That's why we're here, folks. No other things matter. We were born to reproduce. Father, thank you so much for your loving care. Thank you for this church. Thank you for all you have done here. As Tim has shared with us earlier, thank you so much for every person that's come to Christ over the last 10 or 11 years. We are so grateful for how you have worked, for how you have built your kingdom here. Father, would you continue to do that? Would we not lose that passion to see people come to Christ? Would you awake the kingdom seed in us? Would you stir us as Christ followers and not allow us to settle for the life that this world has to give? We were made for more than this. So much more. I pray that we might do what you have designed us to do, which is to pour our lives into other people. May we relate to those around us who are not saved so that we might one day share the truth and may we pour what we do know into those who are younger than us. I pray that every person here would get this. We need groups. We need LTGs. We need relationships. This is what you use. This is the, these are the raw materials that you use to build your church and to build your kingdom. Thank you, Father, that nothing is impossible with you, that you will build your church and nothing will stand in its way. I pray that you will go with us this week as we move out into these communities and be the people that you have called us to be. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.